Our passage today comes from the book of Colossians. So it's in the New Testament, partway through. Colossians chapter 2, and we'll be in verses 1 through 7. Colossians 2, 1 through 7. Now, how many of you remember watching shows when you were a kid? And one of the threats, one of the dangers that sometimes they faced was quicksand. Remember watching cartoons and other shows, quicksand? Oftentimes we thought it would be more of a danger than it actually is in our lives. But quicksand happens when, when sand or some other kind of grainy soil, it gets super saturated with water. It looks like it's solid ground, doesn't it? But it's not. It's super saturated with water and you step in it and you can get stuck. So here's a couple of stories to illustrate it. An elderly couple was walking along the beach one day and there was a somewhat marshy area. And the next thing you knew, they were stuck. Well, rescuers came. And they were able to get her out quickly, but the man, it took him out actually a while longer. The tide was coming in and it was threatening him, but they managed to actually finally get him out before that happened. Uh, Another story, a lady was walking her dog along the beach, and so she stopped to take a picture. And the dog ran down the cliff to the beach and it got itself caught in some mud. She went to get the dog and then she got stuck. And so that was that. She was able to, they rescued her as well. But just so you don't think it just happens at the beach, in Arches National Park in Utah one summer, a lady was hiking and then she got one of her legs stuck and she was there for 12 hours before they were able to get her out. So it can happen anywhere. Now, quicksand can be dangerous, but it's not as common as we might think it is. But what's more common and more dangerous than actual physical quicksand are the spiritual quicksands that we face. And each and every single one of us faces those types of quicksand. But they can be avoided. All we have to do is to stay on the marked trail, not go off the trail. And what that means is that we need to be trusting and faithful in Jesus. We stay on Jesus because he is the solid ground on which we can walk safely and securely in this world. So when it comes to Colossians, Paul gets to this point in the letter, and he is encouraging them that Christ, that Jesus, is all that they need. They can be tempted to follow after other things. There are false teachers that were threatening the church of Colossae with their false teaching, and he's encouraging them, you don't need any of that stuff that they're offering. You don't need anything else. Jesus is all that you need. Jesus is all that we need. And then he's going to go on, and he's going to talk to them, and he's going to warn them about the false teachers, warning them not to be deluded. And he gives a remedy to protect against that. And then he's going to say this, that Jesus is the solid ground on which we live our lives. If we want to avoid spiritual quicksands in our lives, we need to stay standing on Jesus, the solid rock. He is the solid ground that we can live in. He's the sure footing in an unstable world that surrounds us. So let's take a look. First of all, let's take a look at the encouragement that Jesus is all we we need from verses 1 through 3. Paul writes this. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, Paul starts off, he's picking up from the previous section. He talks about how he strives in verse 29 of chapter 1. And here he says that he has a struggle for them. That word struggle, it means agony. It's, it was the ancient Greek word for wrestling. He, he strives. He, he works hard. He is not in this for the notoriety. He's not in this to be popular. He's not in this for the power and prestige of being an apostle. He is in this because he cares for the people that he is ministering to. He cares for the Colossians and for the Laodiceans and for all those who haven't seen him because Paul had, did not found either one of these churches. So you may, they may have thought that, oh, Paul does not have a personal investment in me. He's never been here. Epaphras was the one who brought the gospel to Colossae. And he's the one who led people to Jesus. He's the one who kind of founded the church there. Epaphras learned from Paul. But Paul is deeply concerned for their welfare. He hears how they have been faithful in Jesus. 
in spite of the threat of the false teaching around them. And he's writing to encourage them and to instruct them so that they will stay firm in Jesus. And so he says, I struggle on your behalf. I strive, I wrestle. I am not in this for me. I am in this for you. And he says, so that their hearts may be encouraged. You ever been discouraged? It starts in our heart, right? That's, that's Even the word courage comes from a word that has the root heart in it. He's writing to encourage them. Now, encourage can mean to comfort. That's how, Paul, that's how Jesus talks to about the Holy Spirit as the comforter, the encourager, the one who comes alongside of us. But the word here can also mean to strengthen, to come alongside and to lift up. And, and put your arms around somebody and lift them up. The heart is the seat of our emotions and our will. It's where we get discouraged, but it's where we have the attitudes and the motivations that inspire us to act, that inspire us to live and do what we do. And it's where Satan tries to attack us. You remember the, bre- the breastplate of righteousness that's talked about? It protects our heart. And so here, Paul is telling the Colossians, I am writing this to encourage you, to encourage Laodiceans, to encourage everybody else who might read this letter. I want to strengthen you. You have done good so far. But you're facing this threat. You're facing the attacks of the enemy. And so you need to stay encouraged. And this happens, as the verse tells us, having been knit together in love. That their hearts, that each individual person as a group, is knitted together in love. To knit together means to strive together or to combine together. It's not just walking alongside of one another. It's walking alongside of each other in perfect step. It's being united here. And they're united, they're combined in love. Now what love is it that combines them? One, it's our love for God, right? Well, God's love for us. And then our love for God. And then that affects our love for other people. What did Jesus say the greatest commitment was? Love God with everything that you are. And the second it's like it, love everybody else. I believe y'all talked about that in Sunday school this morning. And so that's the thing. This love that we have for God, God's love for us, and our love for one another, it knits us together. It combines us together. This is the united front. So if the Colossians want to stand firm against the false teaching and against any other attack of the enemy, you can't do it as an individual. You have to do it together as a group, united one to another in love. How are you doing on that love aspect? Loving other people? Or do you like like yourself more? Is your love for God showing itself through your love for other people? You see, this unity in love, this aspect of being knit together as a church, as a church body, as as a group of believers, the family of God in this location, what this leads to is attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance and understanding. It says here that this is a wealth, an overabundance. That's where the idea of full assurance. It is an abundant certainty of understanding. And that's connecting the dots. This is what understanding gets at. This is the idea of wisdom here. It's connecting the dots of how to live. It's connecting the dots of what we need to know. It's putting everything together. And we don't do that on our own. Because on our own, we can look at Scripture and we can have the Holy Spirit witnessing to us, but we can still get it wrong. We need one another to uh, to encourage us to one another, to be uh, with one another, to teach one another, to train one another, to disciple one another. We don't do the Christian life alone. If you want to do that, you're not going to be able to do what Jesus wants you to do because he has designed us for community. He has designed us for family. And so we have this, all the wealth, this riches, the treasury that comes from fully, a full certainty in what God has revealed to us and understanding. And this results in a true knowledge of God's mystery that is Jesus, that is Christ himself. You see, this Understanding this rich, the rich and fulfilling Christian life, it can only be attained when we have this full assurance, this complete certainty that everything God has revealed to us as we apply it to our lives, that results in true knowledge. And that idea of their knowledge is true knowledge. This is knowledge that's gained through experience. It's not just the facts. The devil knows the facts. 
Atheists can look at the Bible and know the facts of what it says. But they will never understand. They will never have a true knowledge, that experiential, relational knowledge of who Jesus is. You see, we're not just brought into a religion. Yes, Christianity is a religion, but it's more. It's a religion that's a relationship. And it's only as we walk with Jesus. Do we grow in our knowledge of Jesus? Do we understand more and more about Him and who He is and His love for us and what He's doing in our lives? This is God's mystery. If we want to know God, we have to look to Jesus. Scripture says that He is the exact representation of God's character. He is the very image of of God, Not made in the image of God like we are. He is the image of God. This is who Jesus is. And we can know him. Not just know about him. We can know him. Because it's in him. As verse 3 says, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now wisdom and knowledge were very important words for the false teachers that the Colossians were They like to use these words because they said, if you want wisdom, if you want knowledge, you have to come through us. You have to do things our way. You have to achieve a certain level. You have to be initiated into the ranks and then you will be able to understand. You will have wisdom and knowledge. But Paul says to that, no. These false teachers are offering nothing because all wisdom, all knowledge is found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. So if you want to have wisdom, if you want to know how to live your life, if you want to have knowledge and you want to understand the things about God and you want to understand the Bible, you have to look to Jesus. Because that can only be found in Him. So if you're having troubles, you have to look to Jesus. If you're going through something and you're suffering, you need to look to Jesus. If you're feeling overwhelmed and overburdened, give it to Jesus. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You see, because Jesus is all that we need. If we want to live for God. We want to do God's will. We want to understand God's will. We want to live that out. We have to look to Jesus. He is all that we need. Now, the world likes to offer up a bunch of other stuff to us, doesn't it? The world likes to say, oh, you need this. Oh, you need this. Oh, you need this. The world has its offerings, but as Scripture tells us, as God is telling us today, Jesus is all that we need because everything else is going to let you down. Every other way of thinking is going to let you down. Everything that the world holds up as right and good that conflicts with God's character and His will, it's going to let you down. But the world is still offering that stuff to us. The world is still tempting us with these things. And so Paul goes on to give a warning and a remedy here in verses 4 and 5. Verse 4, he says this, the warning. I say this, talking about everything that he's just talked about, that Jesus is all we need and Him is all the wisdom and all the knowledge. And we can have a true relationship with Him. He says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. The word for delude there, it's something that's contrary when compared side by side, right? So it's holding up something, but when you actually look at it in the truth, it's not really there. There's no substance to it. He says, don't be deluded. Don't be taken in by what appears to sound good with persuasive argument. Now, this persuasive argument here, one ancient text used this word to describe the argument and line of reasoning a thief made after he was caught, attempt, uh, caught stealing, attempting to convince others to let him keep what he had stolen. The thief is saying, trying to convince people to let me keep what I've stolen. This is the kind of argument that Paul is talking about. The false teachers in the area of Colossae and Laodicea and that region, they were offering something that looked good. They were making persuasive arguments. They were... It's like the salesman's pitch today, right? They're trying to sell you something that you don't want, that you don't need. That's what it was. And the idea behind this word is manipulation. Now, persuasive, but isn't this what we do when we evangelize? It's a different word. Paul talks about persuading others elsewhere, but that persuade there means to convince. In our passage today, it has the idea of manipulation behind it. It's saying what you want to hear to get you involved. 
But when we share the gospel, we're not saying what people want to hear. Oftentimes, they don't want to hear it. When we share the good news, when we evangelize, we are simply telling people what Jesus has done for them and that they need Jesus. Because he is all that they need too. He is what they need. He is who they need. So when we're sharing the gospel, when we're evangelizing, we're not using manipulative tactics. Now some people have used manipulative tactics in the past. That's not what we're to do. We are simply to share what God has done and is doing in our lives, and that he can do in their lives. Here it's manipulation. And so Paul says, don't be deluded. I say this to say Christ is all you need because the world's offering you everything that it may seem like you need. But Jesus is all you need. And so here's the remedy. Verse 5. For even though I'm absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. The remedy here, Paul says, I'm not there with you, but I've heard about this from you. I know this. My spirit is there with you. I am encouraging you in this. I've heard you are doing this. You're doing already what you need to do. Keep it up. And here it is. Two things. Good discipline and the stability of the faith. Now, good discipline is one word in in Greek. It means a good order. It's a military term. It's the idea of of a troop standing shoulder to shoulder, marching in line. Uh, No one out of line. And the idea there is there's a unity to it. No one's getting ahead of the other. No one's falling behind. Everybody is keeping step with another. It's the picture of unity and combined responsibility. And this is what they've been doing. They had been working together to do this. They had been following God's orders. They had been doing what God wanted them to do. They were living for God. And they were helping one another to do so. Keeping up with one another. If somebody was falling back, they they got them and they brought them along. No one was going off on personal missions, leaving the group. There's no such thing as a long ranger Christian who's in the will of God. This is what the idea is. They, were, they had good discipline and they had stability of the faith. That word for stability, it means firmness or solidness. And so the, the military aspect to it is it's just providing a solid front. They had not given in. No one had defected to the teaching of the false teacher. They were standing side by side. They were firm. They were solid. The enemy had not gained a foothold. So what does that mean for us, though? How how do we apply the serenity trials? Because the world is still doing what the world does. The world is still tempting us. The world still wants us to take its bait. Satan wants us to take his bait. What do we do? We need to have good discipline. We need to have good order amongst ourselves. That means we look out for one another. We walk alongside one another. We don't let people go off on their own. We keep them with us. We don't let anybody fall behind. If somebody stumbles, we pick them up. We don't let people, we don't, no one gets out too far ahead. We work together. Remember, we are knit together in love. We have a united front. We are stable here. And what that means is we hold on to our faith, to what we believe for dear life. And how do we do that? We get in God's Word. We want to know what we believe, we have to get in God's Word. We have to study God's Word. Not merely listen to it, not merely read it, we have to know it. But not just know it, understand it, and then apply it to our lives. That is how we stay on solid ground. That is how we stay firm and stand firm against the attacks of the enemy. We need to hold on to our faith, to what we believe, for our very lives. Now, Paul has given some encouragement. And that encouragement was through the unity that we have that Jesus is all that we need. He's warned us that we are not to be deluded, that we are not to be baited into and tricked by the world and the things the world has to offer because Jesus is all that we need. And so we need to stand firm on him to provide a solid front against the enemy. And then he says this. He provides some instruction because it's not enough for us to rest on what we've done in the past. Sometimes we do that, right? Well, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. I'm just going to sit here and wait. That's not what we're to do. You see, we're to continue walking and living for Jesus each and every day. And Jesus is our solid ground. Look at verses 6 and 7. Therefore... 
As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you are instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Jesus is the solid ground. The world out there, it's quicksand. The world's full of cliffs and quicksand and traps and dangers. But Jesus is the solid rock. He is the firm ground that we can walk on. That we can live our lives on. But he starts off this, as you have received Christ Jesus. Now this refers to how they had learned about Jesus. They had learned him through the simple gospel. The false teachers were trying to throw a bunch of stuff on there that Jesus was not good enough. That Jesus wasn't enough. You had to go through them. Either the hierarchy of angels. There's all sorts of other things that they were teaching that are messed up. He says, you, that's not how you receive Jesus. Paul says something similar to the Galatians. You didn't receive Jesus this way. You need to look back to how they received Jesus. But here's the key thing. They have received Jesus. They have received him. They have accepted him. They, they heard the gospel and they responded with faith in Jesus. But if you haven't lived the Christian life, if you haven't done this, you cannot live the Christian life. You cannot walk on solid ground because there is no solid ground for you. You are wandering through swamps and quicksand and dangers. You have to trust in Jesus. You have to give your life to Him. Only then can you walk firmly and live for God. You see, Jesus died for you, right? He died for your sins to bring you into a relationship with God. And that relationship isn't just about following rules. That relationship is so that we can have a relationship with God that's lived out in our lives to affect everybody else. Jesus says, I did not come. Well, I came to have life, to give life and life abundantly, right? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way to please God is only through faith in Jesus. So if you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Jesus, you need to do so because otherwise you are in danger. But it's easy to do. Well, it's simple to do, I should say. It's that simply to give all of yourself to Him. If you'd like to talk with that, about that later, I'd be glad to talk with you about that. But for those of us who have trust in Jesus, and I'm sure most of us here have done that, we still have to apply it. We still have to live this out. We can't rest on what's happened in the past. We have trusted in Jesus, and so the response to that, to giving our lives to Jesus as our Lord, is that we obey Him. We live for Him. As our text says here tonight, we walk in Him. We live our lives in Him. We weren't saved to stand still. God didn't save us just to put our names down and that's it. Oftentimes we talk about just getting saved. Getting saved is the first step in following Jesus. You have to continue to follow Jesus because that's what God wants us to do. And we don't do that on our own. We've already talked about unity tonight, right? Walking together side by side, arm in arm, presenting a solid front. We cannot live the Christian life alone. We cannot have spiritual growth on our own. Yes, we can grow somewhat spiritually, but this was meant to take place in a community of fellow believers, the family of God. Living that out requires us to interact and be around other people and let other people speak into our lives as we speak into theirs. This is what happens when we trust in Jesus. We have been brought into this new life. We walk in Him and we do it together. Having been firmly rooted. Having been firmly rooted. That is to the idea of of taking root. How many of you garden? Any of you garden? Sometimes? That's the thing. What do plants do? Or you know plants. You know, what happens? They, you have a seed, it germinates, and then it pushes down roots. They, they, you know, they put, this is a, put down roots is what we're talking about here. It's the word we get our English word rhizome from, if you know plants and biology. And so what happened is this phrase here was an action that was completed in the past that has an ongoing effect in the present. When we trusted in Jesus, we were rooted in him. We were planted in him. And that is still going on. We we are still growing because of that. We have been rooted in in roots. They take up nutrients for the plant. Jesus said, he is the vine and we are the branches. To use another, another, another illustration of this concept. We get everything that we need from him. Not from following a list of rules. Not from anything that the false teachers are offering in ways of doing things. Or anything that the world says. We grow because we are in Jesus. 
And you cannot grow if you are separated from Jesus and you're not following his will. Now that was the past action that has an ongoing effect right now. Then he says this, that we are now being built up in him and established in your faith. This is what's going on right now. We are being built up. This is the idea of building up a structure following the blueprints to the letter. Any of you ever put it together a Lego set or, or put it together some furniture? Generally, it's best to follow the instructions, right? So you don't wind up with pieces, extra pieces, things that are missing. It turns out looking wrong. You've seen the commercial where they're putting together a piece of furniture and they set a drink on it and it collapses. They didn't follow the instructions. Here we are being built up according to God's blueprint. We are engaging in spiritual growth according to the way God has designed things to be. That requires us speaking into each other's lives. We do this together. We become more and more like Jesus as time goes by because we are to be found in him. He is growing us and there's a result that we are being, we're growing up to be more like Jesus. And we need one another to do that. This says established in the face. This word for established, it originally had the idea of to walk on solid ground. It came to mean later to either have, uh, to be sure-footed, to have something that's firm, to make something firm, or, or to even to confirm something. We are established. We are confirmed. We are walking on solid ground in the faith. As you have, as just as you were instructed. You see, what we have, what we learned about Jesus from Scripture, what we know about Jesus from Scripture, that is right, that is true, that is good. That is the only way we can get to know Him. It's through what we have been taught. The Colossians had been taught about Jesus, and they had been taught the truth. The gospel came to them, and they learned about it, and they learned about God, they learned about Jesus, and they were growing in their faith. And they were standing firm against the attacks of the enemy. They had been saved, and they were being saved, and they will be saved. All because of Jesus, because he is all that we need. And all of this, the solid footing on which we stand, Jesus, the solid rock that we have, that we're walking in him, that we're growing in him, this is to all be shown overflowing with gratitude. Gratitude is thanksgiving, right? And we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? First of all, we've been saved. We have been delivered from the domain of darkness, rescued and transferred to God's kingdom of light, the kingdom of his beloved son, as Colossians 1.13 says. We have forgiveness for our sins. We're no longer separated from God. That should inspire thanksgiving in us. We have God living within us, God the Holy Spirit, indwelling us, encouraging us, strengthening us, even convicting us. For that, we should be very thankful. We have one another to help us, to come alongside of us. For that, we should be thankful. We are still alive. We are still breathing. We can still praise God. For that, we should be thankful. We don't have to work in a relationship with God. We don't have to work to get there. It is all because of God's grace. His goodness. We didn't deserve it. He gave it to us freely. For that we should be thankful. We are to return that grace with other grace. Words the same in the Greek. God shows grace to us. We show that back with our gratitude. We praise Him. Right? We thank Him. We glorify Him. We live for Him. We obey Him. And we have this opportunity to not only for us to be changed, but for those around us to experience that change as well. We have the good news, and it's good for a reason. It's not meant to be hoarded and kept to ourselves. It is meant to be shared. Are you overflowing with gratitude because of what God has done and is doing in your life and what he will do in your life? Here's a little thing to take away this week to practice this. Each day, take a sheet of paper and just write down at least one thing for which you're thankful. I would encourage you that if you think of multiple things, write down as much as you can to be th that you are thankful for God. You will find, I'm sure, that when you really think about it, when you count your blessings, as the old hymn says, you're not going to run out of things to thank God for. It could be as simple as, Lord, thank you for letting me wake up this morning. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for the air that I breathe. Thank you for getting me through this work day. 
Thank you for getting me home safe. Thank you for that parking spot that was really nice. Nothing wrong with thanking God for that. Just take some time this week and, and write down and think about Think about and write down things that you are thankful to God for. And your perspective is going to shift. In just a couple months, we're going to have November, that month of Thanksgiving. It would be cool if you could do something each day leading up to Thanksgiving. Two months worth of things. And you still won't get to the end of it. That's how good God is. That is how good Jesus is to us. So here's the deal. Jesus is the only solid ground that we can live the Christian life on. The world will try to tempt us, to sway us. It will try to delude, delude us. Try to get us off of Jesus and lead us astray. But He is the solid rock. He is the firm foundation. He is the solid ground and the sure footing that we need in this ever-shifting, ever-changing world that's constantly just going down the gutter. Everything that we need to live the Christian life, everything that we need to live is found in Him because He is all that we need. He is all that we need. We're not to be deluded, but instead we are to have that preventative medicine, that remedy of good order and discipline and stability in our faith. And we are to live our lives secure in Jesus. So, what are you going to do with this message? What are you going to do with what God has said here to us tonight? You might be doing well. You might be just like the Colossians and saying, you know, I'm standing firm. You know, I'm doing these things. I am good. Well, thank God for that, right? Praise Him for His goodness and His grace in your life. But still be on the lookout. Beware. Keep on the solid ground that is Jesus and continue to obey Him and follow Him. Maybe you're being convicted of some sin or something, some danger, some path that you have started to wander away. You have gotten into the quicksand of this light that this world has to offer. The great thing about it is we have a rescuer who is reaching out his hand towards us. All we have to do is take it and he will pick us back up. He is faithful and just to forgive us if we confess to him. If we, go to, if we cry out to God, if we cry out to Jesus, he is going to take our hand and lift us up and put us right back on the firm path. So if you've been convicted, confess and get right with Jesus. Maybe God is saying something else to you today through this passage. Or maybe even it's not related to this passage, but He is impressing upon you something on your heart. The best thing to do is obey that. As the Colossians are being obedient and living out and walking in Jesus, you need to do the same thing. Take a step out in faith. Because if you're on Jesus, you're not going to go astray. In just a moment, we're going to sing, sing a song. It's a time of response. Whatever God is telling you to do, whatever He is working and laying upon your heart, say yes to that because you won't be disappointed. Instead, you will have the sure footing to face anything that this world has to offer. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord, we come to you and Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your love and your care towards us. You are indeed an amazing God. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for empowering us and strengthening us to live for you, no matter what may come up in this life. Lord, help us to stay on the solid ground that is Jesus. Help us to live for him, to not be deluded by the things of the world, but instead to be obedient and to follow your orders and to do what you want us to do. Thank you for the encouragement that you offer, both the comfort when we're in distress and the strengthening that we need when we're overwhelmed. Lord, you are indeed a good, loving God. Thank you, Lord. Help us to always be thankful for what you are doing in our lives. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.